what you just said now yeah. is that the burden of the cross of, of the Nigerian writer. Um, I, I mean, I'm always wondering why does the average Nigerian writer do only a print run of 500, 1,000 copies, yeah. that's all, you know? And we have so many talented Nigerian writers. What, what's, what exactly is going I on? I can give you a simple analogy, a simple example of why that happens. Black Earth was published in Nigeria in October 2015. And it came out and then it was published in the US in March 2016, this year. Between March and August and July, the end of July this year, Blackers has sold 11,000 copies in the U.S. Between October last year and, um, and today, Blackers has sold about 400 copies in Nigeria. That's why Nigerian publishers, you know, it is a massive difference. Um, and so you have to ask, because Blackers has gotten attention in Nigeria. If you, people tweet about it, people say, but then you have to ask, who's buying it? You know, is it that a lot of people who talk about it online or who you know, don't actually spend money buying? Maybe they borrow from friends, maybe they get from torrent sites, I don't know. But there is that disparity in actual sales. And so you, if you're a publisher, and a publisher is a businessman, he wants to sell something that gives, you know, that gives something back to society, so he takes a book that has ideas and he prints it with his money, and he puts it out there, and he expects to make a profit. And when you print 2,000 copies, and you sell only 400 in the early year, then you begin to ask, is that a viable business? And so you might have people like Farafina someday ending up selling soup if the Nigerian you know, readership doesn't improve. So, so primarily it's about readership. I mean, it comes down to readership. How many people are keen on paying money to get copies. It's, it's about readership of books that are sold as entertainment. Okay. I am a co-writer of a social studies book for Farafina, and it's a social studies book that's taught in um, several schools in um, Nigeria. And that's where I get my most money from in Nigeria, textbooks. Now, I, I, this is not even, I don't have the, I was a co-writer, like I said, there were about four writers, and so I get zero point something percent of the royalty, and yet, every year it brings in more money for me than my two books combined in Nigeria. So the problem is? That the readership in Nigeria, there is a readership. There are people who buy textbooks because they have to buy it, because they have to pass exams. There are people who buy Bibles because they have to go to church. There are people who buy Bishop Uyodeku's books because they have to you know, they want to get some knowledge. There are people who buy books for reasons that they think are important to them. I mean, some of the biggest selling books in Nigeria, which was addressed in this book, um, business books, uh, you know, self-help books. We see it in traffic yeah. every day. I mean, how many times have I seen things fall apart in traffic? Mm -hmm. But you see rich kid, you know, poor dad, rich dad in traffic, and you see, you know, and so th those are the books Nigerians buy. And they are going to those books because they want some, these are functional books. You go to the Bible for you know, spirituality, you go to self-help books to get some knowledge that you'll use to improve your life. But there are not many people who will buy a novel because they think it's just entertainment. They think, well, I'll watch a Hollywood movie. They think, how is this going to affect my life? How is this going to improve, you know, increase my salary? So, so there are many people who don't see the value of um, of books that you read for supposedly for entertainment, but for a lot deeper than that. That's very that, that's very discouraging for fiction writers, isn't it? In Nigeria, it's not. It is. It is what it is. I mean, as I'm a Nigerian, I'm a fiction writer. I live in this country, and so that's the situation. But it doesn't discourage me because, in the end, it's it's not about money. I want some money. You know, I want to have a good life. But if that doesn't come, I also write my book. I mean. Wale Shoinka wrote, the man died on, on, you know, on um, pieces of toilet paper while in prison. I'm sure he wasn't thinking about money while he was there. He was thinking about, I need to get this knowledge, this view of the world out there. Um, so for me, it's, same, it's, it's similar. When I sit, sat down to write Blackers, yes, I hoped it will sell and get some attention. But at the same time, I needed to get the story out there.
And so once that's achieved, and once I have a publisher who accepts it in this country, that's 90% of, you know, of what I want to achieve has been achieved. Um, yeah, the remaining 10% is just... Okay, uh, um, black ass, race, gender, yeah. all sorts, you, you, yeah. you took them on. I threw everything hey. and the <laughs> is, that, is that, is, what were you trying to do? Were, were you trying to entertain? Or there was more to it for you? Were you trying to send a message out there or share your views and your, the, the way you see things, your paradigms of, on, on many of these issues and all that? I was trying to do all of that. Because that's what you try to do with fiction. You try to do everything. You try to touch people. You try to heal people. You try to inform people. You try to entertain. You do all of this with fiction. And so for me, in writing Blackers, I wrote it because I had a dream that one day all men <laughs> will become equal. <laughs> you know, but then I am not you know, Martin Luther King, so I can't go out and give a speech. And what I can do, the talent I have is to write a book. And I felt there were some things I saw in Nigerian society and some things I felt even, some things that I didn't even realize I saw until I started writing the book that needed to be expressed. And so that's why I sat down to write the book. I, and once I sat down to write it, I had an idea of what I wanted to write, but then at the same time, once you tap into fiction, subliminal messages start coming up. You remember things you, you, never, you, know, you thought you never knew. And, um, and so at some point, the message just kept coming. And once I started writing this book, it became important to put in everything. At the same time as I was, as I was writing this book, I had my own personal issues. This was the first novel, so I was dealing with that, and that got into the writing of the book, the ways in which, you know, within the, within the narrative of the novel, I was also discussing with myself. So in a sense, it felt like a conversation between me, the writer, and Nigerian society, and between me, the narrator, because in the end, everything's coming out of my head in the book. You know, between me, the narrator, and me, the person who's, sitting down writing it. So it was, it was this, you know, polyvoiced, you know, polyvocal, you know, conversation going on that I tried to contain and tried to carve into some sort of fictional universe that will give entertainment, provide, you know, give inf information, and then um, also potentially make me a millionaire. You're <laughs> <laughs> going away to that. Um, now the, it's been translated into Italian language, yes, it Chinese. Yeah. Um, which other language now? So far, Italian, Chinese, but then it was published in the UK and the US. What's so attractive to the Italians and the Chinese here? Is it the, is it the entertainment side of it, or is it the way you described Lagos, for, for instance, the whole, uh, um, and then the whole idea of racism, black and white, and yeah. so on? Do you, have, do you have any idea? I don't. I mean, I know in the, in the Chinese case, I'm surprised because I, um, I don't know what it was about the book that interested the Chinese publishers, but I'll, I'll hear from them someday about it. The Italians mentioned that um, for them it was the writing style, and they felt um, my voice was important, and was, they, they had a new vision of modern day Nigeria through my writing. So that's what they said. Um, the, in, um, in the US, funny enough, it's what has most caught the attention of Americans, what has drawn them to the book has been the title, which seems to be about... I was going to say this is very American. <laughs> yeah, which, was, which, is supposed, you know, which seems to make it a book about um, bigotry and, you know, and, um, and racism. And that's if America is going through fraught times now. And so several people came to the book through that only to discover that it was a book about Nigeria. And um, I've, I mean, the New Yorker reviewed the book and the New York Times review of the book also mentioned that, that is that view of Lagos that you get from the book and they call it the view of a modern mega city and how characters live within that city. So some people have called it a travel log type book. I had no idea I was writing a travel Very log. Very much then, travel so, log. Yeah. <laughs> and so for many people, they take different things from the book. But I guess I put in enough into the book to give people whatever they wanted from it. 
you know, um, yeah. Igodi, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Well done. Thanks.